Okay. Okay, let me start over again. Sorry about that. Uh, just take a couple of minutes. Okay, back to the meeting page. Uh, uh, thanks for joining the badging life cycle practice meeting. Please abide by the hyperlogy code of conduct and the antitrust, keep the antitrust policy notice in account. Um, so we have, uh, we're going to continue where we left off in the last uh, task list meeting we had, which was four weeks ago, because uh, I missed the last one because I was sick. Um, in the previous meeting, we had discussed, uh, it, we were going through the list of badges, or list of proposed badges, which are in this table, and we reached up to the infrastructure badge, and uh, a couple of weeks later in the POC meeting, we reviewed uh, the notes that we had made, and uh, uh, there was some uh, discussion on, on those, but we only dis discussed the first two, the legal badge and the diversity badge. So uh, I was just trying to get the, before we started recording, I was trying to talk about the diversity badge. We, uh, uh, I think that's easier to resolve. I don't think there were any major concerns that TOC had about this or any major uh, comments. Rai confirmed that we can add a <clears throat> company affiliation in the maintenance.md file, and uh, we can potentially use that as uh, uh, an easy way to track the uh, diversity of maintainers via GitHub Action. Uh, and Tracy had a comment on uh, how we determine uh, what percentage of maintainers are in each company. I can I think the simple way of doing that is just by passing the maintenance file and assuming that each maintainer is contributing at an equal level. Um, if you want, if, if anybody has any concerns about uh, uh, whether different organizations are pulling the weight, then I think you can al always have uh, a TOC member uh, probe further or have uh, uh, the TOC question the, uh, the project maintainers as was done last week for both the cacti and the Firefly uh, incubation exit review meetings. So, uh, any other comments on that, or do you think that's, that's it's good to park and move on? I think that sounds good to me. Okay, cool. Um, that makes it most about the legal badge, and I think there was some questions here about uh, how. Uh, how we track non-compliance. I think, uh, Tracy, you had made a comment on this in one of the earlier meetings as well, where I was listening to recording. Um, I think you had mentioned uh, that maybe Hyperledge Bevel had some uh, files that were, that, that had some uh, licenses that were not compatible with, with Apache. So I think if we have a situation like that, the comment that I heard on in the last POC meeting was that we have to uh, consult with legal staff. So uh, how do we, uh, any thoughts on how we uh, uh, codify the process there? Is this, uh, do we, first do we just say that, do we mandate that there needs to be some kind of an action that will check to see whether uh, the code is covered by uh, either Apache or compatible licenses, and uh, it can also flag if code is covered by some non incompatible licenses. And uh, if it does, then uh, that will automatically uh, result in a, a review, which will which may involve consulting with the legal staff. Does that sound good? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think from the you know, it, it really is something that we need to stay on top of, right, for projects. And so um, if if something is not correct and nobody's going to fix it, then it se sounded to me like last time we talked in the TOC meeting that it was a case for basically the Linux Foundation to basically remove that project or move that project to a private until uh, such time as, you know, somebody actually fixes 
the concerns that exist with legal. So um, I, I think that's, you know, it pretty much is you're either compliant, which means you're a project in Hyperledger, or you're not compliant, which means you're not currently a public project or public repo within Hyperledger. Okay, so this is, uh, I think it's Mark that here. Uh, should be uh, just having the life cycle as a reference. Suppose the project is graduated, or let's say even if it's an incubation, and then it, it it's discovered to be or it goes out of compliance. Um, do we do we just uh, when you say take it offline? Do we deprecate it or do we just completely remove it from the slide deck? Uh, I would say that if nobody is taking action within a month, then the project uh, needs to basically be moved to end of life, um, it feels like, right? Because if, if that project repo is going into a private status, um, then that project basically doesn't exist, right? So let's say we have, it's difficult because we have projects that are um, multi-repo projects. Um, so in the case of a project that is a single repo project, it's easy to say, move it to end of life, right? Um, but in the case of a, a multi-repo project, does the whole project go to end of life or does it, is it just that repo that goes to end of life, um, if you will, right? Uh, so I think this is a tough question um, because I don't know that I know what the right answer will be until we actually discover that issue. I don't know, yeah, I think... what do you guys really think on this one? I think if the a multi-repo project uh, and uh, if only particular repos are at end of uh, are in non-compliance, then uh, my personal preference would be uh, to uh, to have a light touch that is just move the repositories that are not in compliance to EOL and uh, uh, that will. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, that should at least be a trigger for the maintainers to, to take action. So I don't, I think uh, if anybody's depending on the active repositories that are still uh, in compliance, they should be allowed to. I personally, I think that, that'd be my opinion, but uh, I'm open to others. In this case, we are mostly concerned about um, like the project having like meeting certain criteria, right? And and if a release meets that criteria, I think it won't change over a period. Why do we have to like recheck within a month? I think the I think the what I'm trying to say is if nobody takes action within a month on a license, that's bad. Okay. Uh, then, you know, if, if there, if the action is, I'm going to peg this to, uh, the previous version, right. Until I can fix this in a better way, that's taking action, right. If the action is I'm not responsive and I'm not doing anything, um, then that's a, that's a clue that this pro this particular thing should probably head towards an end of life state because nobody's maintaining it. Mm -hmm. right. I, I agree yeah, the, with pending actions, then it makes sense. Yeah, I, I think uh, different repositories have their own release, different release cycles. Like uh, Fabric, you have uh, the core Fabric repository has a very different cycle and a different uh, 
versioning cadence than the Etabic SDKs do. So uh, I think uh, if uh, the SDK goes out of uh, compliance, for example, then there's no need to make uh, to force the core fabric repo also to go out of compliance. So, uh, so I don't, I don't. I mean, I I uh, I take the point that we should uh, peg this to a release. Uh, or rather, we should uh, evaluate a uh, uh, compliance against a particular release. I think that's something we had we mentioned here somewhere. Right? I think Jim asked the question, and uh, I uh, confirmed that. And I think generally we all agreed about that. Um, the the release, uh, yeah. I mean, we can uh, just because uh, the latest release of the SDKs stay out of compliance doesn't necessarily mean that. that the core repository of that piece. That's my opinion. I mean, it, it's tough, right? I think that it would be ideal if we could do some sort of license scanning for each pull request uh, to be able to determine whether or not something went out, right? And not even let it go in um, at that point into the, the source space, but um, obviously that's, there's cost involved there and um, I think it becomes a challenge. So what is the right, the right time to do that um, is I think the question. Yeah, and I think I agree with what you think. I think best to, if we can have a full proof test uh, with PR, that would be, that'd be the best. Uh, in case that, uh, something escapes that actions uh, diagnosed, then uh, we will have to go through this uh, review and uh, penalty. Process. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on to the. Uh, just uh, before we move to the next item. The last thing we were discussing the last time was in the in the last Tasco's meeting was uh, whether we need an infrastructure badge, and I think tentatively what we concluded was that uh, uh, based on uh, my going over the recording, um, the there are particular uh, criteria for infrastructure that are a given even for a project reach a proposal stage. So whether it be a lab, even whether it be a lab, so um, or or other once the project is approved as a lab, the infrastructure gets automatically created because we have, we have a, a competent administrators who do that for the project, whether it be a lab or a source project. Uh, so those things are, are given. Uh, there are other things associated with infrastructure that we wanted to track via badges, which was whether or not the maintainers are, uh, uh, are maintaining repositories that, uh, that confirm to hypology standards and uh, whether the meeting is also responsive to uh, community requirements. So tentatively, we agree that uh, we can shelve the, the core parts of the infrastructure or maybe just have, uh, uh, or maybe it could be like a, like a badge that is issued to a project when its proposal gets accepted because that's sort of a, a given. We, we can just maybe have it as a, just as a, uh, as a label to to show that the project fulfills the basic criteria. Other than that, the project has to earn its responsiveness and conformity badge, or uh, more accurately, it has to maintain those badges. So, uh, as long as the project uh, uh, is uh, seen to be conforming to the standards, it will keep the conform uh, conformity badge as defined further down, which is does the look and feel of the repository structure and the documentation match that of other projects? And uh, uh, according to what Hypologer recommends. And and also for responsiveness, uh, are the maintainers engaged with community and responding reasonably promptly to, to questions? Um, so uh, again, the, the, what are the precise criteria? Uh, just be defined, we may get those from the documentation and onboarding task force as well, which Bobby's leading. Um, but yeah, uh, we can potentially have a, uh, let me just see that. Put this. Yeah. 
So uh, have uh, an infrastructure label by uh, uh, by by default. Uh, I think uh, or and then actually I don't know. Do we even need that infrastructure label by default? Because it's a uh, once the project is created, you know, we know that it has a repository, at least one repository, and mailing list and uh, Discord chat. So I think maybe we can even share that. And as I think Preeti suggested last time, we just have the responsiveness and accessibility badge. Is that okay? Yeah, I, I think that we could potentially even replace this, like you said, with a, um, you know, a, an acceptance badge, which is, I think we could have one of two badges there, right? A labs badge or a top level project badge. Um, Right, reflecting whether it's in labs or it's a project. Um, and then once, because we would issue that badge basically once all the infrastructure is set up, right? The Discord channel, the mailing list, whatever, um, you know, the GitHub repos, um, that sort of thing. So I, I kind of like that idea that you had, Rama, which is kind of that acceptance badge and, and just splitting it into accepted as labs or accepted as top level project. Oh. How about uh, um, on the similar lines, like along with saying it is accepted project or a labs project, maybe in the readme we have, um, right now it is difficult for different projects to find information of the, all these links. For instance, if somebody mm -hmm. was in, in getting a Discord link for a project, I don't think so all projects have easy to find way to, to redirect people over there. Um, since we are talking about infrastructure and we want uh, to make sure like everybody has the infrastructure, maybe we'll bring in a uniform way of announcing all this information. Um, I, I don't know if it's possible, but I've seen certain projects having uh, those badges listed on the readme page, which says click this link and then it takes them to a discord link or maybe click this link, it takes them to a recent build power status or maybe recent test coverage status. Yeah, I like I like having the Discord link or the mailing list link. Um, the the challenge with Discord is that you can get a link to the channel, but if somebody hasn't actually joined the Discord yet, it doesn't actually work. Um, it works great for people who are already part of the Discord server. Um, so it's kind of like, you, whenever I put these things together, I always say it's on the, you know, hash foo channel on the Hyperledger Foundation Discord server. And I like the foo channel and then I like the Discord server as two separate things. Um, one is the invite to the Discord server and the, the other one is the link to the, the channel itself. Um, so I don't know. It's probably an improvement that uh, Discord could make, right? Which is if you're not part of the Discord server, consider that an invite to the Discord server. But uh, you know, I, I suppose they have to be able to support multiple types of servers, and ours is very public versus others who might not want that to be the case. Uh, I don't. Every isn't every project supposed to be supposed to have a channel, uh, at least one channel on the public Hyperledger Discord server? Yeah, I think we actually say that uh, when we set up Discord, uh, we went through that chat task force. I think we said there were two channels that should be created by default, which is the, you know, the main project name and then the project name dash contributors. Um, so that there were distinction between the people who were using it and the people who were contributing to it. Um, there's been obviously some discrepancies since that task force, but those were the two that we said needed to be created. And of course, we don't do that for labs. We only just create the labs channel. Um, we don't have a, two separate ones, so, um, but yes, we do. And, and labs are optional as far as whether or not we create a discord channel, it's up to the labs maintainers if they want one or not. Okay. 
Um, anything else on this, uh, this particular batch? I mean, this is the, yeah, I mean, this particular badge is something I think uh, you can't really lose, right, once you get it, because it's, uh, it's uh, the HyperLage staff, like all the HyperLage admins who are, uh, who provided that for you. As a team. So, yeah, I guess there's a question of, do you lose the accepted as labs when you get accepted as a top level project, right? Does that like take precedence, if you will? I mean, you were obviously accepted as lab, so there's no reason to get rid of it. And you were obviously accepted as a top level project, so there's probably no reason to get rid of it. But there is this question of, does one take precedence over the other? And so that's the one that you display. Um, and then the second question around this is, when something goes to end of life, do you get rid of that or do you leave it? I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter because it's end of life and nobody's going to be looking at it. but. Uh, you know, I guess there is this, you know, question of does it go away or does it not go away? I'm perfectly happy for us to say it never goes away. I think if it's an end of life, uh, there's a chance that uh, the Discord channels have died. I mean, there's no activity there, then the project should not necessarily have the accepted uh, badge. So I am okay with saying that if a project actually goes to EOL, it automatically loses the accepted badge. Sounds good. So let's move on to the CII criteria. So, so this is what is there in the original badging recommendation. Um, question is, should we use this or should we use, uh, there are a couple of other things we can use instead of this. There's the open SSF best practices uh, requirement, which is already listed in the incubation exit criteria. And there's also the Hyperledger best practices guide, which is listed in the POC repository, I think also in the Hyperledger wiki. Um, should we use that instead of this? I'm not, uh, I don't turn to the, I don't know the history behind this. Yeah, so I think, I think the CII actually ended up becoming OpenSSF. Oh, yeah. okay. So, so yeah. I think it's it's one and the same. And so I think we can go with the open SSF um badge, if you will. Um right. yeah. Uh, what about the hyperledger uh, best practices? Should we consider those? That's a good question. Um... We we'll probably have to go through them and see Which ones would make sense? Okay. Uh, this has actually a lot of considerations around project life cycle. So, I think, okay, <clears throat> I think this is, this is a summary of the incubation. And this is kind of covered by the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, some hey, maybe about, maybe we yeah. maybe we should consider having badges for some of these if we don't already have badges for some of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, you know, do you have an exclusive naming? Uh, that should be a like a yes no sort of thing, right? Uh, badge that we could could set up. So maybe maybe we should go through each of these and compare and contrast to what we have in the other list, right? And determine what we need yeah. to add um, that might not already be there. Yeah. We can make a note of that. Because uh... I, I think, you know, they're obviously important what we have in the best practices, but I don't want to be duplicative either um, <laughs> and uh, make people have to go through more or make us have to, to run more um, scripts than we need to, right? So I, I just want to come to the, you know, the set that uh, covers everything, but not more than once. I agree. Uh, so, uh, we don't have anything explicitly that covers the presence of a maintenance file, but uh, as we listed in the, as you mentioned in, in the legal criteria, if we are going to be parsing a maintenance.md file, we sort of get the check for a maintenance.md file uh, by default, right? Uh, what be. So I think we can, uh, that's one way we can compare and contrast between these, these criteria and, and what we have here. So if something is already covered by a badge here, like the maintenance MD file is covered by the legal uh, requirement, then we can just uh, subdue that uh, in that. We don't need a separate check for maintenance MD file. Uh, on the other yep. hand, Sorry, <laughs> thanks. But on yeah, I'm just agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we uh, we can we could potentially consider a badge, uh, or or rather uh, some check that will just uh, look for the presence of a particular uh, uh, file, like uh, have, have a checklist, maintain.md, security.md, uh, the latest security policy template as we agreed upon yesterday. Uh, the presence of that, uh, having an RSC folder, uh, maybe we can just, uh, maybe we could have a check for, uh, like the basic, um, uh, structure, but I think, uh, that could potentially be subsumed into like the, uh, confirm it. I don't know if you want to make, make it part of conformity, but I think we could put it. Put it there because that's mm -hmm. kind of related. So. Sort of covers the repo structure. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yep. Okay, let's quickly make a note. Yeah, I think um, Rama on that one. I think it's not the yeah. legal one. I think it's the diversity one that. Uh... 
is the maintainer's file. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, if you just click and say on link, I think is. is there an option for that? I don't. Uh, don't right, right click. don't don't right click. Just I think it's a uh, yeah. There you go. Oh, on link. Perfect. Okay, so two action items here. One, I think we can uh, just have an open SSL best practices badge. And what was the, what I have here? It should be uh, at a passing level, right? Yes. I mean, is that a requirement for all uh, projects in all stages, do you think, or uh, just for the ones that uh, want to be graduate? So that's maybe mm. a criteria thing for Panda. Yeah, I, I think that it is not a requirement for all. Um, I think we should look at what the percentages are and see if OpenSSF has any recommendations. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, obviously that graduated state that we have today is um, is intended to be that. I also wonder, since OpenSSF is a fill it out manually sort of thing, does it ever, once you've set yourself to 100%, would you ever go out of 100%? Right. I mean, I think there are possibilities that you would, um, but only if you were to go back and redo the open SSF questionnaire again. Right. Um, and so, like, I think it's an interesting badge, but I, I think there's also some challenges with the badge when it, it's manually uh, documented as to one, what did people actually answer the questions in the way they were supposed to? um right have things changed since last time they filled it out uh so there's there's in my mind i guess some some challenges with the um a manually reported on that never gets looked at again yeah okay I think uh, for the criteria, we can probably just say that uh, the it needs to be passing at least for the graduating stage. For other stages, we can maybe say that uh, the checks will be there, but it need not be passing. Yeah, and it could be it could be for labs. Maybe they haven't even started it for incubation. They have started it. Um, but it's not yet passing, right? I, I think there's, well, you know, we'll have to look at what the right um, way to look at that is based on, um, you know, either recommendations by OpenSSF or um, maybe even we could see if other people use this badge and, and how they use it. Moving on to the next one, the security. Uh, again, these are, I think this was the last one that was in the original list. So the others are what uh, I've added as suggestions. So security, I think, uh, um, is this already watched, Adam? So more is right. Yeah, this is not merged, but it's approved in a studies call. Right. Um, so, again, there's a question about how much you want to slice and dice. So, if we, uh, if you're going to be tracking all the basic files in, in one action, we don't need a separate 
security uh, badge or we can have a something separately okay. what, i think there's uh, there's yeah. there's two things for security in my mind one is um do you have the standard documents right which i think are part of uh the the cr uh the common repository structure right which i think we should be checking um to make sure people are matching the common repository structure the second piece is around security if they've had a security issue did they follow the processes did they um, meet their 90 day timeline right i, I think there's there's some things around uh, that we've seen in projects where they haven't really followed that 90 day um, disclosure piece, right? Um, and that timeline that exists there. But so I think there's, you know, and that one's obviously harder to um, to create an automatic badge for, um, but it is something that I think we should consider. Okay, uh, I think, uh, how do we track the fact that they have uh, they followed through here? If, uh, uh, we are not using Hacker One anymore, right? No, no. Okay. Well, um, I mean, Fabric, I think it was the only one using it, and it sounds like they want to move away from it, so. Uh, I would say no, we, we probably wouldn't be using Hacker One anymore. Um, it could be, you know, there was some discussion yesterday about changes that the Hyperlighter Foundation was going to make, but I think that was mostly around bug bounties. Um, so I don't know. I don't know that we have any way to track, like the open security issues obviously like this is not something that's going to be obvious to us unless um the hyperledger foundation is tracking it right i mean uh, so one thing you can do uh, if if somebody follows if somebody looks at the security uh vulnerability reporting template and then they file a bug and classify it as security you can potentially look and see uh, look through the issue open issues and see if uh there are any outstanding security issues which have not been resolved in the ninety days. That's mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Do you think that would cover this? Yeah, I think that might cover it. Uh, this makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense. <laughs> uh, how does this uh, does this overlap with the animal review process as well? Imagine <clears throat> going to be tracking these things there as well. Not that we going to look at, and I'm, I'm sure part of the annual review is whether or not the maintainers have been uh, uh, tackling security vulnerabilities. So I'm sorry, I missed you. You asked if it overlapped with what? The annual review process. Ah. Uh, I don't. That's I don't side in.
if the or are we making life easy for the annual re review uh, process by having badges which can give a uh, and uh, can give a clear picture of uh, what the project has been. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I think. Go ahead, Ron. No, go ahead, Tracy. I was going to say, I I think that there will be uh, that it will definitely help us with that annual review cycle. But I think there are places where there'll still be some manual um, work that's required to look at certain things to see. Right. So, for example, one of the things that we might consider is um, a project had, say, four security vulnerabilities. They dealt with three of them in the time frame they were supposed to and one that wasn't. Uh, how how would we deal with that? Right. Um, so I think there's there's some some work that will still need to be done, even with the badges. But uh, yeah, Arun, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I see it as an opportunity uh, like during annual review for people who are reviewing to um, like re re refresh these badges if they are still applicable or not. I mean, they will help, but I see as an opportunity for us to relook into if the if any of these badges is still valid. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, you maybe were deemed for having a security vulnerability past 90 days. Uh, when was that? And have you since then fixed that process such that it, that's not really a longer a, a ding because you've worked through whatever the, the issue was originally and, and, and fixed it? Um, so that makes sense to me, Arun. Um, no. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think other than that, I think uh, this needs to be a criteria for all stages. This is a serious security serious matter. Um, okay, next one that I thought we could consider was uh, uh, this, this is something that I actually was thinking about early this year. Uh, in fact, it was in the list of items that I was I had proposed in the first UT meeting. Uh, whether projects are uh, uh, doing something unique, or uh, if they if some of the components are uh, already being worked on in other projects or have already been developed in other projects, then should we ask if they uh, have cross hypology project dependencies and not reinvent the wheel? So, okay, something like, for example, uh, connect uh, ledger connectors. I think I imagine, I mean, Cacti has been, uh, probably other projects have been too under different guises. So, I think generally speaking, yeah, go on. Now. Sorry. I just wanted to say, like, should we restrict this to just hyperledger, or should we say this project is not reinventing the wheel in, in case? Um, so the, the things that I would probably be interested in is that I don't want any of my projects that I'm using to reinvent the wheel in terms of uh, maybe like adding a new cryptographic functions, right? I would expect them to reuse if, it, if there exists one. Or I, it will increase the confidence in in me in the project. I can be sure that um, it's it's been peer reviewed across a large community. Um, I'm I was I'm not sure, I don't remember the real purpose of this particular um, section, but if the intention is about you mean the badge within the yeah uh, reusability no, this, is, 
Right. This is my proposal. This is not there in the original list. The original list topic C I. So oh. I just have a yeah. From security onwards, these are my uh, suggestions. So yeah. Okay. Sorry. Then I misunderstood. Right. So I I would prefer um, my confidence on a project will increase if I can I can be sure like whatever they are using is of good quality or I know like for that depend those dependencies would be maintained for a longer time. That's true. A uh, couple of hazards. Uh, one is if the if say you have a cryptographic tool that's not within Hyper Ledger, but uh, it's open source, but it's governed by say GPL license, right? So that will then be incompatible with uh, with Hyper Ledger. So then maybe there's a case to allow um, somebody to implement their own uh, module for that, even though technically it's doing the same thing. So, um, that, that's okay. But what are we achieving with this patch? Like, what what are we trying to communicate to the you so to to the end user? The, the, the biggest incentive for any project to achieve any of these patches for them to showcase that they are meeting the highest standard set. Um, and yeah. so with this, what I, I, I agree. With you. I, I, I agree. With you. I, I can't, uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I think this is this is more just a concern. Um, uh, it's just a, a checklist item for whether people are following, uh, generally good software engineering practices. Um, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know if this actually says something to the end user, so we can probably strike it on this job. Well, we can Great keep it. Yeah. Uh, go on. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. We can keep it. Um. I'm still trying to see how to best put it. But yeah, that's a good good uh badge, to think about. Tracy, any thoughts? Uh, I think my thought is, at what level, um. Right, are we doing reuse or looking at the uniqueness of it? So for example, will we claim that fabric is unique um, given that we have other distributed ledger projects within Hyperledger? Um, I, you know, I think that there, in my mind, there's certain levels of uniqueness and is the level that we're looking at, which is dependencies or um, integrations with other projects across Hyperledger. Um, what is that level, I guess? And, and would it be, as Arun says, useful to people as they are looking at, you know, is this a project that I want to use? Is this a project that I think is going to continue? Um, you know, what, I don't know that we know the right level of looking at this uniqueness. Um, and so it, until we can come up with something that is more concrete, right? It sounds like a great idea, but like, I just don't know that we can um, communicate what it is that we're trying to get across to the person who's going to be looking at the badges. Yep. Uh, all that makes sense. And, and other uh, okay, I think then for now I'm just going to strike this off because as you say, uh, this on the grounds that this does not necessarily commun necessarily communicate something about the project quality as uh, is relevant for an end user to decide whether they can use the project, whether they can use the project API. So just strike this off for now. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, striking it like this means that we can come back to it if at some point we do come up with something that's concrete that we think would be very useful for people to be able to understand from this. 
because I, I personally like it. I just not sure that I have the right answer for how we measure it or um, what it is that we're specifically looking for. All right. <clears throat> Can you have time to just throw one more entry in this four minutes we have? Um, we have CRTD. Uh, I think quite self explanatory. Um, do we don't have a sort of pattern outlined yet, but that is task force that is devoted to doing that right now. So, what do you think? Should we have a badge here that uh, will be about any project that? Uh, follow those guidelines that uh, Peter and team are trying to create. Is is the badge a the way you have it written right now? It's not necessarily a yes no. It's how well do you conform to those best practices? Is is am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. It's similar to how uh, I think how we're looking at the project best practices as well, and uh, it does that. Yeah, and I think the what we came up here was we just have to break this up into different criteria and try to figure out if uh, any project is meeting those independent criteria. So yeah, I mean, if you take all the criteria together, it'll be how much you cover it. Uh, but then if you take ind individual criteria, then it, it's a binary question. So, so yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. Here, this is somewhat vague at this point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we should definitely come back to this one when um, Peter's further along with the the list of best practices. We can you know determine whether or not it's a percentage of met or a Let's break this off into separate things. Sure. Okay, I think we are just one minute away, so maybe we can call it to a close. And uh, how many do we have left? Um, I think we discussed some of this the last time. Uh, open SSF, uh, I'm going to strike it off because we've already covered this the previous one. Um, conformity and responsiveness, this deeper, uh, what we wanted to call out in place of the infrastructure batch. Uh, or rather, access to the infrastructure badge. So that's there. And uh, maybe we can just discuss about maybe production. Maybe we can just discuss it the next time. I don't know if uh, you have any quick thoughts on this. I, uh, I I don't know how we would necessarily evaluate uh, whether the project is production ready, except to ask whether or not it's been used in uh, some uh, uh, publicly verifiable software, like. Uh, like I think uh, we, we showed examples of this both for the cacti and for firefly usages last week. So yeah, I think I think we should potentially recommend an adopters.md file um, in the you know common repository structure that would allow us to uh, at least see whether or not there's any adopters. Um, I, I think this does two things for us. One, it gives people an idea of who else is using it. Uh, and then secondly, it allows people who are using it that maybe we don't know are using it to do a pull request um, to say, hey, I'm using this particular project, which I think is, is very valuable information for people then. Um, they might know who to reach out to, uh, to get additional requirements for, for new roadmap features or, or whatever the case may be. So. Um, I'm thinking that an adopters.md file might be a really good thing to, to add to our requirements. 
Yep, I think that sounds good. Thanks for this. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we we'll, we have a couple of things. Maybe uh, not we haven't complete slides out yet, but I think we can cover that in the next call. Maybe uh, in the next call, maybe we can wrap this up and create some concrete recommendations. But I'm going to before the call, I'm going to clean everything up and uh, drop a proper list and fill in all the entries in the table and. Yeah, hopefully we can come to a conclusion within the next meeting or two. Sounds good. Thanks so much for your time and for your suggestions. I really appreciate it. Yep. Have a good weekend. Thanks. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.